if you all remember, I was campaigning for uh, Brexit um, and I voted out. I am a British citizen. I came to Britain over 26 years ago and I called it my home. Britain gave me freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, security, which I needed to become a better man. The things which I couldn't get in the country I was born in. So I'm grateful. I'm a grateful British citizen. I'm a grateful migrant. After leaving Islam, I was worried for my security. And uh, I was worried that the British culture was being plundered by migrants from everywhere, being a migrant myself. Because I saw many migrants not respecting the culture, the tradition of this country. And I campaigned for Brexit. But eventually, I could see the bigger picture. And I could see that how we were fooled how we were misinformed and I dug deeper and I realized that this world belongs to us there will be bad people in every community and we need to do more so that people um, of this country can make the migrants understand the deserving migrants understand the value of being British and being respectful to the British culture but at the same time, we must also um, welcome multiculturalism, which I was vehemently against, because I thought that multiculturalism wouldn't work. But they can live side by side. And I believe that the, the, we should just simply learn how to value, respect our differences. That's all. So. Over the years, I thought that, uh, at least for the last three years, since uh, I left Islam, that um, people hate Muslims and Islam is a hateful cult. I was uh, seeing that uh, the interpreters of fanaticism are agreed upon by the terrorists and also those who um, leave Islam from different angles. Those who leave Islam, they think the Islam that terrorists follow is Islam. So they agree on that, on the identity of Islam, which misleads both. One misleads someone out of Islam and the other one misleads into a hardcore understanding of Islam so I didn't see the bigger, bigger picture I didn't see that over the centuries Islamic scholars helped to engage in flexible interpretations of Islam with the help of jurists fiqh and other experts and I overlooked all that although I knew all that over this over the decades that I was preaching Islam, but still I slipped away. I uh, forgot that the British, they plundered our wealth in South Asia for centuries, turned us into a poor nation. But still, the, Brit the British gave us a lot. Even during the imperialist past, the modern world that we know of comes from the British mostly. But uh, at the same time, the imperialist past of almost every nation doesn't bring any glory. So we must admit that. So we must also teach the world how to distribute the wealth. And the best way forward would be to remain in the European Union. So I will start my campaign for remaining in the European Union. Bangladesh is one of the fastest growing economies of the world. Dhaka, the city I was born in, is a mega city. But in that very city, the British were cutting off thumbs of my forefathers for weaving textile 
only about 150 years ago. So it's all a matter of perception. I'm ready, as always, to debate with any ex-Muslim and uh, uh, to prove that how Islam is a religion of peace. I condemned terrorism even when I was a Muslim in 2015, when there was an attack in Paris against civilians. But I, I can see now in India, the Hindu fanatics, the RSS and BJP, the Bajrang Dal, they are all following the traditions, the heinous traditions, the murderous tra uh, cult of Nazism and Hitler's backshirt and even British fascism. So, Heil Hitler of Germany is now Jai Sri Ram of India. When most of the scholars will say Ram was not even a god, he was a king. So Muslims are being forced to chant Jai Sri Ram. So evil is everywhere. Since I came back to Islam, I've been receiving barrages of hate messages, abuses, and all sorts of insults from ex-Muslims, from um, uh, Hindus who used to uphold themselves as, uh, you know, as the leaders of freedom of conscience. Now I'm getting abuses instead of willing to engage with me in debates because I'm always for debates. I debated uh, great Islamic scholars even when I had left Islam. You know, I, I even debated for atheists when I was a Muslim before that. So I'm still open-minded and I'm, I can assure you that we must learn how to live together, how to cooperate, and how to grow together. Otherwise, creating walls like Donald Trump will never solve the problem. Fascists like Narendra Modi must never be said, howdy, Modi, rather be said, adios, Modi. Listen up to the uh, video following mine and see whether you can disagree with any of the claims by the uh, Indian scholar. The next question is from Kevin Peterson. <laughs> My question is to Sashi Tharoor. Happy Olam first. Oh, thank you. Uh, um, you too. You, you, you mentioned about Britain, uh, mentioned that Britain left India in, uh, in a worse off condition than, than it had it been without Britain. Oh, you also mentioned about reparation from Britain. What about the skills in engineering and manufacturing India acquired, the administrative and democratic processes it inherited, the infrastructure left behind, and most of all, the rapid education of the Indian people, of which you are an excellent example? <laughs> Surely, no one can price these intangible values that were gained during the British rule in India and propel the country to its present position as one of the leading countries in the world. Finally, one more question. <laughs> I'm doing a Jeffrey Robertson here. In your opinion, where would India be today if the British did not step into India? Oh, there's a lot, lot there. It'll take the rest of the program to answer. I'll try and touch on it. But this is almost like... Uh, the American saying to the widow of the American president, apart from that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play? <laughs> you know, really, the British came to one of the richest countries in the world, uh, accounting for 27% of global GDP in 1700, 23% uh, in 1800, and over 200 years of exploitation, depredation, loot and destruction, reduced it to a poster child for third world poverty, uh, uh, just over 3% of global GDP, 90% of the population 
living below the poverty line when the British left in 1947, a literacy rate, you speak of education, a literacy rate below 17% and a life expectancy of 27. The growth rate of British India from 1900 to 1947 was 0.001%. That's what they were doing while draining the country of taxes and resources. Education, my gosh, the British, the last thing they wanted to do was invest in educating Indians. Uh, it, Will Durant, the American historian traveling in India as late as 1930, pointed out that the entire expenditure of the British on education in India, from the nursery level to the highest universities, was less than half the high school budget of the state of New York. All the Indian Institutes of Technology, the engineering achievements you're talking about, were established after independence by the government of India. Uh, there is simply no comparison between the accomplishments of India rising from the ashes the British left us in and what was done in 200 years. Just, just, many, take, many just, just, just take one example, the yeah. textile industry, because India was a, a huge exporter of For 2,000 years, it was yes, the world's leading exporter. What happened? In fact, in the Roman Empire, there are debates recorded by Pliny the Elder yeah. of Roman senators complaining about the amount of the Roman Empire's gold that was being sent off to India because of the tastes of Roman women for Indian muslins, linens, and, and cottons. But was so it, was, it just, was it just modernism, the industrial revolution that destroyed that, that, or was it something else? No, that's the excuse that apologists like mm -hmm. to make that, you know, oh, it's not our fault, you just missed the bus for the Industrial Revolution. Well, we missed the bus because you threw us under its wheels, is what I tell them. <laughs> I mean, is in the name of free trade the British came in and destroyed the free trade that had made India a leading exporter of textiles. The British soldiers smashed the looms so people couldn't practice their craft. They imposed punitive duties and taxes on the export of Indian textiles while lifting duties on the import of British cloth and they achieved a captive market at the point of a gun. This is not exactly free trade as you can imagine. Cities like Murshidabad and Dhaka and the subcontinent were depopulated. In one notorious incident, weavers had their thumbs cut off, so when the looms were repaired, they couldn't weave again. Textiles were systematically destroyed as an industry by the British, and that's only one example of many. Well, in the I'm going to quickly go back to a question now. Now, Kevin, um, do you accept that perhaps the British weren't quite as benign as you just? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. Please read the book, Kevin. There's a lot more there. <laughs> I've got the book. I'll bring Laurie in here. He gave a speech along these lines to the Oxford Union. He got wild applause um, from the students and others sitting around the Oxford Union Hall. And I'm just wondering, have young Brits come to terms with their colonial past? Uh, no, we haven't at all. Young Brits of every class have no idea about our colonial past. And that is, that is being deliberately done. We are deliberately denied or you know, kept away from education about the real, the graphic facts of what the British did around the world, you know, including in this country, to the people of this country. Uh, the crimes of the British and the crimes of the, that we committed and that were done in our names uh, over 400 years of pillage and conquest is something that we don't like to think about, and yet it is everywhere in modern British history. When people talk about Brexit, it's stunning to me that if you ask British people who voted for Brexit what their major fear is, their fear is that people will come to our country and take our things. Mm. And That's exactly like, You know, <laughs> why? Yeah. I, I, I just can't... It, it doesn't compute, but we don't know this history. You know, I took history in British schools up to the age of 18, and I got a pretty good grade. And most you never of, learned a line of colonial history, did you? Well, almost everything that you have just said, I learned from your book. I'm going, to, I'm going to throw quickly back to Shashi because um, you know one of the great heroes of the Second World War, in fact, of the 20th century, uh, Winston Churchill. You've basically accused him in your book of complicity in a famine that killed four million Bengalis. Rightly so. Four point three. I mean, Churchill personally took the decisions that actually not only plunged Bengal into starvation, but had the British 
actually purchase grain that the Bengalis could barely afford to buy in order to ship it to Europe, not to aid the war effort as his defenders claim, but to boost the buffer stocks in the event of a future possible invasion of Greece and Yugoslavia. People started dying and Churchill said, well, it's all their fault anyway for breeding like rabbits. He said, I hate the Indians, they're a beastly people with a beastly religion. Oh Australian ships were docking in Calcutta port and were ordered by Churchill and his odious paymaster, General Lord Chobel, not to d disembark their wheat, but to sail on to Europe, where their wheat might be used in some future reserve stock. On top of that, when conscience-stricken British know, officials... Did, yes, I was going to say, did Churchill know people would die? Yes, uh, conscience-stricken British officials are constantly sending memoranda to the Prime Minister personally, because it was his decision, saying that people were dying literally on the streets, and all Churchill could bring himself to do was write peevishly on the side of the file, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? Wow. And this is the man the British want us to hail as an apostle of freedom and democracy, when he has as much blood on his hands as some of the worst genocidal dictators of the 20th century. Well, thank you. We South Asians, with our uh, unique uh, religious backgrounds, which are, which are generally different from the Christian or atheist uh, majority United Kingdom, with our uh, Islamic, Hindu, or Sikh backgrounds, we form 4% of the total population, but we contribute 6% into the GDP. So, we are deserving migrants. So, economically, we have contributed Britain better than the, if you want to call them indigenous English people. So, we are deserving people. We have made Britain greater. So, how can multiculturalism, how can religious differences be detrimental to the society? Rather, it has increased the tolerance level of the British people, which they didn't see during the British imperialist past. There was always an endeavor to impose the British ways. Our, our language got second grade treatment, English got priority, English culture got priority. Look at us wearing English clothes in South Asia. So our culture was plundered but at the same time Britain has learned and we must not slip away into fascism we must not slip away in in the name of uh, you know to, to saving uh, British culture we must not slip into fascism because that's going to corner Britain from the global community and uh, if you want to look ahead we must not forget that Asian countries were rich and they are going to be richer again. So we don't want a time where the British people will be queuing up for jobs. There are already many of them are for, for uh, going to the um, Asian countries. There, there will come a time when the Brits will go to Bangladesh for jobs. So my dear friends, we must not create a world which is selfish, must not. And we must learn how to tolerate, how to fight evil together, because we are together in it.